Writing a great plot twist isn't about trying to think of something wildly original, some show-stopping bit of magic that comes to you in a fit of inspiration. It's actually about a very simple design process. On the agenda today, we're talking about what a plot twist actually is, how to brainstorm great plot twists for your mystery novel, and how to make those twists pack an emotional punch. Hey everyone, I'm Jane, and the first thing we're going to do today is just lay out exactly what a plot twist really is. It's something the reader believes that turns out to be false. That's really all we're talking about here. At the end of Planet of the Apes, when Charlton Heston approaches a ruined statue on the beach and discovers that it's actually the Statue of Liberty, it comes as a big surprise because we believed the apes world was a different planet. This belief is false. The apes world is actually Earth, just many, many years in the future. We had a belief that we now know is false, and that gives us that wonderful moment of cognitive dissonance that we call a plot twist. And so you can begin to see how your job as a writer begins by just making the readers believe something that you know isn't true. Let's say we're writing a nice traditional mystery set in the English countryside. The elderly patriarch of the family, Lord Pemberton, has invited four members of his extended family to stay at his country estate for the weekend so they can talk about some changes he's planning to make to his will. Also present are his lawyer, who will be making those changes, his doctor, and a single housemaid. The characters come together and various character storylines are spun up, many of which have to do with the financial troubles that Pemberton's heirs are finding themselves in. Before long, Lord Pemberton is murdered, and we naturally assume that the motive must be to prevent him from changing the will. That assumption restricts our suspect pool down to these four characters, his heirs. Our sleuth is going to focus on these characters, and when it turns out that the killer is the maid, it's going to come as a big surprise. Now let's talk about the assumptions that we've encouraged the readers to make that make the maid's guilt come as a surprise. First, we encourage them to assume the motive. It's natural for the readers to assume there's a financial motive because we give them that nice juicy will change to look forward to and because we've peppered them with a bunch of financial talk from the heirs. The reader thinks they understand the motive, so they're not really on the lookout for another. However, the motive could easily be something else. Perhaps the maid is afraid of Lord Pemberton because he's been harassing her. Or maybe she wants him dead so that she can marry his son, a marriage he never would have approved of. Another assumption our readers have made is to assume that the maid isn't an heir. Okay, maybe the motive is inheritance, but our assumption that this motive doesn't apply to the maid is incorrect. Uh, perhaps she has a secret rela relationship with him. Maybe she's his daughter, or uh, maybe even better, she's the mother of his illegitimate child, who she knows is mentioned in the current version of the will, and she doesn't want to see that changed. Hidden motives are one of the best ways to bring about a plot twist, and they're executed mostly in the two ways we've discussed. Introduce an unexpected motive, as in the case where the maid is afraid of Pemberton, or introduce a way for the existing motive to apply to an unexpected character, as in the case where the maid is the mother of Pemberton's illegitimate son. Uh, either way, we need to make sure that our motive makes sense with what we already know about the characters by adding supporting details, or we might just call them clues. Uh, in the case where the maid is afraid of Pemberton, we'll need to see her be reluctant to be left alone with him in the earlier part of the book, or maybe we'll need to hear about some characters talking about how he's harassed other servants in the past. In the case where she's the mother of his heir, we'll need to see her son uh, perhaps have the opportunity to note physical similarities between him and Pemberton. Perhaps we'll also learn that Pemberton has been making secret payouts to an undisclosed person and that he has a history of engaging in extramarital affairs. Aristotle said that a great ending needs to be surprising and inevitable. Well, we're going to say that a great ending should be surprising and supported. Uh, we need those little clues there in the early part of our book to support our ending without giving so much away that it fails to be surprising. Thumbs up if you're liking this video so far, and then let's talk about some other assumptions we can encourage the reader to make. Uh, this time not about the motive, but about means and opportunity. All right, let's say that Pemberton died at the dinner table, very obviously of poison. He clutched his throat and died in grand dramatic fashion. Now our suspect pool is going to restrict down to these three characters, the maid who prepared the food, and Pemberton's daughter and niece, who our sleuth will learn were in and out of the kitchen. But we've still encouraged our readers to make a lot of assumptions in this scenario, so what are they? 
Well, first, they've assumed that the poison was in the food. Uh, perhaps the poison took effect when Pepperton was at dinner, but it was actually given to him earlier in his medicine by the doctor or in a glass of sherry by the lawyer. It could even be in the pepper, which has been always sitting on the table and which only Pemberton likes to add to his food. They've also assumed that the poison was meant for Lord Pemberton, but two plates of food might easily be swapped. Uh, maybe the poison was actually meant for someone else and finding out who it was will change everything we understand about the crime. Uh, in this circumstance, where the food has been unwittingly swapped, Pemberton could actually be the killer. And honestly, even though Pemberton clutched his throat, poison is still an assumption that we are encouraging our readers to make. Pemberton might have been ill, or he might have been acting, maybe faking his own death so that he can smoke out which of his heirs actually wants him dead. Everything your readers think they know about the murder, the apparent means of murder, the apparent time and place where the victim died, all of these details can be deceiving, and all of them allow readers to make assumptions about exactly what happened and who might have been responsible. One famous example is from the movie Chinatown. The victim, Hollis Mulray, is found drowned in the city reservoir, which restricts our suspect pool. We assume that the people with the greatest opportunity to kill Mulray at the reservoir were the officials of the pal powerful California Water Company with whom Mulray was fighting. But... Mulray's body was actually moved to the reservoir. He actually died in his own backyard pond. The supporting clues for this are found throughout the movie. Early on, we see Mulray's gardener trying without success to get something out of the pond. Uh, later, we hear the details of Mulray's autopsy and learn that his lungs were full of salt water, not fresh water, as would be in the reservoir. And near the end, our sleuth investigates that pond and finds Mulray's glasses. That's when he knows that the assumptions we all made were false and that Mulray was likely murdered by a member of his own family. So we've created some crimes that naturally give rise to false assumptions. But let's say that we've spun up a couple of crime ideas and there's nothing that really is striking our fancy as a particularly satisfying twist. In that case, our next step is going to be listing the assumptions inherent in the entire premise and see which of them might be fun to violate. So we've got an old man, Pemberton, surrounded by his heirs, about to change his will. What assumptions are inherent in that premise? Well, first, we're assuming that Pemberton actually has a fortune to give away, that he's not secretly destitute. We're also assuming that everyone is who they say they are, that none of the heirs is in fact an imposter. We're assuming that Pemberton was telling the truth about his reasons for the gathering to discuss the changes to his will, but he may actually be intending to expose a dark family secret, something the killer is desperate to prevent. And we're assuming that Pemberton is the intended victim. Maybe the killer was going to get sloppy and kill the wrong person. You can go on like this for quite a while and come up with some really great twists. Uh, maybe Pemberton himself is already dead, but the heirs don't know it because he always communicates through his lawyer. Take any scenario you like, uh, start listing the assumptions it includes, and you will find something that can make a great plot twist. Now let's take a moment to talk about core assumption violations. So sometimes the assumption that you are violating isn't one that you've encouraged the reader to make, it's one that the readers brought with them into the story in the beginning. So for example, in a mystery, we generally assume that these people are not the villain, the victim himself, the people closest to the sleuth, either professionally or emotionally, and the sleuth herself. However, I have read mysteries that violate each of these assumptions, and it always comes as a huge, delightful surprise. Here are some other core assumptions that we can count on our readers bringing with them to our book. One villain or team of villains is responsible for all the crimes in the book. So we can violate this assumption, perhaps by having two villains each carrying out separate plots unbeknownst to one another, or maybe by having one villain piggyback onto the first villain's crime. The victim didn't want to be killed. Well, we could violate this assumption, perhaps by having the killer and the victim working together to carry out an insurance scheme, which will leave one of them dead, but the other very wealthy. The killer actually wants the victim to die. Uh, we could violate this assumption. Maybe the killer makes a fatal mistake resulting in the victim's death. The first victim to die is the villain's true target. So some ways this could be false is if the villain killed the first victim by mistake or perhaps to divert suspicion from his true motive, you know, by 
killing someone with an obvious connection to his true victim, he forces investigators to zero in on the connection between the victims as the motive, ignoring the villain's true motive. The best plot twists not only surprise, but they also have an emotional impact, uh, like this somewhat overacted one right here. You uh, learning that the ape world is actually Earth means something to Charlton Heston. It means that he will never go home and everything he loved has been destroyed. That is a bitter pill to swallow. To make your mystery twist have an emotional impact, you want to let us get close to the characters who form the plot. So I'm not talking about the sleuth here. We are naturally going to be getting close to her, but I'm talking about the community of characters who she's investigating. We want to tell a story about these people, an emotional story. We want to let the reader come to care about them and understand them a little bit. Your readers need to really like that maid or to truly dislike that lawyer. And they need to come to understand something about Pemberton and how the people around him have affected his life for good or ill. That is how we deliver an ending that is not only surprising, but resonant and meaningful. In my next video, I am doing a deep, deep dive on clues. So if you don't want to miss that, definitely hit that red subscribe button and thanks for watching.